Actually, it's pretty good average, uh, very consistent with previous years, maybe a little better than a, than a few of the previous years. So that's pretty good. And to have a median of 82.5, that's really awesome. So I think you guys did a good job for the most part. So if you're close to the average or higher, you're doing great. If you're a little bit under average, it's OK. You have other ways of getting more points. So, but if you have any concerns, happy to meet with you and talk to you about it. Okay, you can, I posted the key on Canvas so you can look at your exam and a lot of time I say say key, see key. It's easier than for me to write the answer for you on each every exam. So please do see the key um, to make sure that uh, you understand why I marked it wrong or right or whatever. Okay. Uh, all right, so how do we measure total carbohydrates? Or how can we measure total carbohydrates? You are a pretty quiet group. Evan, thank you very much. Go for it. Okay, so we can measure total carbohydrate by difference, but if we actually physically want to measure carbohydrates in, let's say, a simple uh, matrix of food, not complicated, because total carbohydrate is really hard to get an accurate measure of total carbohydrate when you have starch and you have um, fiber and you have small sugar, oligosaccharides, it's really not that easy, but if you have a beverage, let's say, and you have mostly sugars in there, what would be a method we talked about last time that you will do in the lab next week that we can use to measure total carbohydrate? Yeah. The phenol sulfuric acid method. In this method, we use the sulfuric acid, the concentrated sulfuric acid, to actually hydrolyze um, our sugars into monomers and then the presence of heat that is generated due to the addition of a very concentrated sulfuric acid will result in changing the sugars to furans and furans will react with the phenol group and that will give you a compound color and that's what you measure and we want to have a standard curve and if if we know the components of sugars in our sample, it would be great to generate a standard curve that contains those sugars. If not, oftentimes glucose is the standard that is used. Um, but glucose and fructose react differently, and it's not a stoichiometric reaction. So different structure will have give you a different intensity of color. That's why choosing standards for this method is very important. OK. Um, what are the preparatory steps for carbohydrate analysis? What's the first thing you want to do? Dry the sample. But before we dry the sample, what do we want to ensure? For everything, anything you analyze, what do you want to ensure? What do you want to ensure before any analysis? Save us, Sally. Yes. Make sure you have a representative sample and a homogeneous. So representative sample and homogeneous sample. Then what Lauren said, pre-drying, especially if, if you have a higher moisture uh, type of food. Then what else do you want to do? What else do you need to remove to not interfere in the assay? As well? Yes, yes. Remove the fat, and now what left in your sample is mostly the carbohydrates and proteins. So we get rid of moisture, we get rid of uh, fat, so you have your, and so of course you still have some minerals and vitamins in there. If I want to analyze mono and diamine and that's where we stopped last time, is extracting those for analysis. What, how would we extract them? What are they soluble in? Nathan? Yes, so you can do 80% uh, alcohol. 
So you can extract them and then your polysaccharides and proteins will precipitate. When you take the extract, you, uh, you can run it and clean it. You can run it through an ion exchange to clean it from organic acids and salts and free amino acids. And then you will have a cleaner sample. Then you can evaporate your alcohol using a rotovap and then reconstitute in any solvent that is uh, compatible with the assay that you will be performing to measure those uh, saccharides. Okay, so and that's where we stopped last time. Let's go back, kind of backwards. Okay, so that's where we were. Okay, so if we're after measuring monodial and oligosaccharides and specifically reducing sugars, there are a bunch of colorimetric methods um, that are commonly used and they have the same principle. So basically, because we're measuring reducing sugar, so then we are uh, basing this method on the reduction of cupric ions in alkaline solution to cuprous ions by the reducing sugars. And then uh, the, this will generate a color and a certain amount of cuprous, cuprous ion that can be measured to quantitate sugars. And there's different ways of measuring the cuprous ions. And there are three common methods that are used. And the most common one is the Smoogie-Nelson method. These are basically the last names of the scientists that kind of developed the method. Uh, but they all, like I said, have the same principle. All you need to know really is cupric ion is reduced to cuprous ion by reducing <coughs> sugar, and then you quantitate uh, the product that is formed. So in different assays, you use different reagents. I'm not going to have you really memorize those different reagents. And the quantification, what you really want to know is how you quantitate. So you generate cupric oxide. You can actually, it's a precipitate, so you can measure it gravimetrically by weight. Or you can titrate with either sodium pyrosulfate or potassium permanganate in the presence of an indicator. So you can do that. Or the Smoogie-Nelson method uses uh, the reduction of an arsenomeloptate reagent. And then you get a really nice blue color that you would measure absorption at 520. And this requires the um, having a standard curve, basically. Having a standard reducing sugar. Um, but again, this is not a stoichiometric reaction. So if you're measuring glucose, versus a ketone, which is, a ketose, which is a fructose, you would have a different intensity of color. So you basically need to have a standard of that particular reducing sugar that you are trying to uh, quantitate. Okay. So basically you generate, so this is the formation of a blue color, and you precipitate cuprous oxide, which is brick reddish color. And you get this. So you get the blue color and you get that reddish precipitate. And somehow, sometimes, you can get this. You cannot really get a distinct reading if you're measuring absorption of the blue uh, compound form or if you want to precipitate the, C, uh, the cuprous oxide and measure it. So what is wrong here? versus here. What, do, what you, could you have done that resulted in this? It's a very simple answer. What would give you a lot of cuprous oxide? What would generate a lot of cuprous oxide? What is generating cuprous oxide? The presence of what, Grace? Yeah, so what did I do here? Two concentrate. Two concentrate, that's very simple. 
It's just a simple indication that sometimes you really have to dilute your sample so that you don't run into too concentrated in this kind of situation. All right. So this is basically uh, not small, so smart of a question. Guess what? It's a juicy chili. Is what you're measuring here. And how can we analyze sucrose? Sucrose is not a reducing sugar, so you need to do a step prior to adding the cupric oxide there or the source of cupric iron. So, one thing you want to do is break the glycosidic bond. And that you would do with acid and heat, then you would get glucose and fructose, then these are reducing products, then you can measure <coughs> the reducing power or reducing amount. So another type other than colorimetric methods, we have a very famous way of measuring monodion oligosaccharides, and that is by using use of enzymes. So it is a very common method in the analysis of carbohydrates in general. You'll see that we'll use enzymes to measure total starch. We use enzymes to measure the components of starch, amylose, amylopectin. We use enzymes to actually also measure dietary fiber. So they're there in the analysis of carbohydrate. Enzymatic methods are very, very common. Um, so the enzymes are proteins, obviously, and they have catalytic activity. <clears throat> they lower the activation energy. We'll talk more about enzymes either at the end of this week or next week. Um, they're highly specific, obviously, um, and then they convert reactant to products. And the products often are the ones that you would measure absorbance. So often when you use enzymatic um, <clears throat> methods, you tend to generate a product that absorb light. Or you use a reactant that absorb light. And when it reacts with the enzyme, then you actually have less lower absorption. So either absorption increases or decreases, depending if the reactant is what's absorbing light or if the product is what's absorbing light. So we use these enzymes in food analysis to determine constituents. And the constituents are often your substrates for the enzyme. So since we use spectrophotometry to measure a product or a reactant, your solution needs to be clear. So you don't have cloudiness. You don't have scattering of light. So you don't have erroneous uh, overestimation. Sometimes you have inherent inhibitors in the samples. That means your sample uh, might have, if you're using amylase, there might be an amylase inhibitor naturally in your sample. So you want to make sure that you inhibit, uh, you inactivate that inhibitor so that you can have an actual assay that works. <clears throat> very important uh, thing is that these reactions often are um, two, two reactions are involved. So two-step reactions. So the first reaction is called the auxiliary reaction or the measuring reaction. So if you see measuring reaction or auxiliary reaction, there shouldn't be a that here in the middle. So it's called measuring reaction. So if you, that would be the initial reaction. So you have your constituents of interest with a reactant and then an enzyme here you get a, two types of product. This product, if you take it and react it again, so neither of these would absorb light. Neither P or Q or A and B absorb light. So it's kind of our introductory reaction. Then one of these products, if you react it with another constituent, you might end up with a product that has that absorb light, or C itself is a product that absorbs light then either you measure an increase in the absorption if you're measuring R or S, or you measure a decrease in absorption if C is the one that absorbs light. 
In both cases, you have enzyme 1 and enzyme 2 needed for this kind of reaction. Here's an example for measuring glucose. So you have two reactions that are needed. The first enzyme is hexokinase, so glucose reacts with ATP. With the hexokinase, so the glucose uh, picks up phosphate, and ATP becomes ADP. So the, it loses a phosphate group, basically. So neither of these absorb light. Neither the glucose 6-phosphate or the ADP absorb light. So we need a secondary reaction, which is the indicator reaction. We call it the indicators because one of the components is absorbing light. OK, so here the glucose 6-phosphate is the product that will react with NADP. NADP does not absorb light. Uh, in the region of measurements where we're measuring here, you can see and it's not absorbing light. And we use a, a second enzyme, which is the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So I'm pulling out the hydrogen from here to give it to, to NADP plus to give it to produce NADPH. And that's what absorb light. And in this case, I'm measuring an increase in absorption. Okay, so here the, the product of the second reaction is what we are uh, measuring. So to determine the glucose in your sample, this is one way of doing it, but you really need a standard curve where you use glucose standards and you plot your standard curve and get the equation of the line in order to determine the actual amount in your sample. Okay. So applications, we have enzyme assays for fructose, glucose, and galactose for monosaccharides. We have assays for lactose, maltose, and sucrose, oligodisaccharides. Um, and then we have assays for polysaccharides, total starch, or specifically aminose and specifically amylopectin. So the advantages of that is usually your assay is specific for glucose or specific for lactose or specific for sucrose. And now we have kits that are commercially available. So you basically get the enzyme, get this reactants, and all the reagents that you need, and, and then you have um, operating procedure that comes with the kit. You just follow instructions and you do it. Very, very easy. <coughs> And generally have low detection limits, so that means you have low thresholds. So which is a good thing. This means um, you can measure you can measure low concentrations. Now, disadvantage is sometimes you have interfering compounds. That means they would absorb light at the particular wavelengths that you're monitoring. So that is a potential possibility, and that's when you probably need to use the standard addition method. Uh, that we talked about in spectroscopy. Um, not always 100% specific. Sometimes other monomers, if it's a monomer assay, might be detected. Uh, sometimes if it's a disaccharide, for a disaccharide, more than one disaccharide can be analyzed by the same assay. Okay. <coughs> Moving on to chromatography. So we covered Colorometric assay, enzymatic assay, but also chromatography is a big, big part or tool in measuring um, oligomonoldi and oligosaccharides. So both paper and thin layer chromatography can be used just for screening mostly, not necessarily quantitation, just screening for what types of monoldi and oligosaccharides are there. So can you can use um, um, Paper chromatography, you can use thin layer chromatography. Sometimes thin layer, you can actually get the intensity of the spots um, because you get better resolution uh, with TLC than with paper. And you can, when you get the intensity, you kind of get some sort of quantification if you're running standards. 
standards on the same plate. Here are some examples in terms of what stationary phase you would use versus mobile phase. So here, for example, you can use cellulose paper for paper chromatography, whereas in stationary phase for TLC, it can be either cellulose, silica, or impregnated silica, and organic mobile phases. So here's where we're going to spend a little bit more time because this is where the quantification is rather than um, planar chromatography. Actually, uh, HPLC is very commonly used to quantitate accurately monodi and oligosaccharides. And many types of or many ways uh, of HPLC can be used, modes of separation I meant to say. So you can either use normal phase, or reverse phase, anion, or cation. So, but for each, you require different um, ways of handling your sample, and also the mobile phases. So we'll talk about all of these. So starting with normal phase. So here, we talked about chromatography earlier. Now we're talking application. So this is going to show here. We will talk about chromatography when we talk about proteins later on. So it will come almost in, in many lectures coming for, going forward. So in this case, let's look at normal phase HPLC. And in normal phase HPLC, can, can you tell me what type of stationary phase uh, in terms of polarity and modified silica? Is this a polar or non-polar? It's four. So in nor a normal phase chromatography, just to re as a reminder, you have a polar stationary phase and a non-polar uh, mobile phase. So if I want to increase the strength of the <coughs> mobile phase, what do I do? Make it, more polar. Make it more polar by adding more water and reducing concentration of uh, organic solvent. So thank you for remembering that. Okay, so what happens here is you have silanol groups. And the silanol groups in the silica gel, the activated form of silica, will react with the hydroxyl groups of the carbohydrate. But they are going to react so strongly that you wouldn't be able to see separations in the carbohydrates. So you won't be able to separate glucose probably from fructose or sucrose. Uh, or whatever other you have. They will interact very strongly and they might elude together. So what we do to make it work is we use the chemically modified silica uh, stationary phase, or also known as hydrophilic interaction liquid chromatography. We talked about hydrophobic interaction liquid chromatography earlier in, under chromatography, but we didn't necessarily specify the hydrophilic interaction liquid chromatography, with, which belongs under normal phase HPLC. So here we have a specific interaction, which is hydrophilic interaction, that takes place. So how does it work? What is a modified silica? A modified silica, so here's your silanol groups, they get modified with um, a compound that has an amine group. So we call it amine bonded stationary phase. So now the, your carbohydrate will not react with the silica strongly. They will form hydrogen bonds <coughs> with the, the amine group. So your OH groups on the carbohydrate will react via hydrogen bonding with your amine group. Mobile phase is acetonitrile water, so it is it starts with being non-polar mostly. Separation will be influenced by common temperature, and we talked about that in chromatography. And let's see. Okay, so the order of elution, if you look here, you have fructose, glucose, saccharose, lactose. So basically, 
the more OH groups you have, the longer is going to interact with the column. So smaller sugars will come first, or sugars that have less OH groups will come first. But those that have more OH groups will interact more with the amine groups via hydrogen bonding. The detection or uh, the mode of detection usually is with the refractive index detector. Do you remember why we can't use gradient emission? It has to be isocratic. Do you remember why? Do you remember why? Because it will change the refractive. Yes, it will impact the refractive index. Because you are measuring the refractive index, you only want to measure a change due to a component leaving the column. You don't want to measure, mix that with a change in the mobile phase. So we cannot have, that's one major drawback, so you cannot change the mobile phase. You would have to run isocratic. You know, it might take a long time to elute everything, but that's the only way if you have refractive index. Another drawback is you have limited column life. Why? Because the amine groups can, might form a shift base, might interact via covalent uh, interaction of, with the reducing sugar. Uh, the carbonyl group of reducing sugar to produce a shift base, kind of the Maillard reaction, really. So with that, you have to regenerate the column more uh, often, and you can add modifiers. So you can add modifiers to the mobile phase. Uh, basically, when you prepare your modif the mobile phase, you add, let's say, amine groups. You add soluble amine groups that will continuously regenerate the amine groups that are lost due to the formation of the shift base. Or, instead, what I meant to say is not necessarily replace an amine group on the silanol groups, but the modifier will shift the reaction. If there's anything that's going to react with amine groups, they might react with the modifiers in the mobile phase rather than interacting with the amine groups on the stationary phase. There are different modifications available as well. So dial bonded stationary phase or cyano bonded stationary phase as well. Okay. So reverse phase HPLC can also be used, but in reverse phase HPLC, what's your stationary phase? Is it polar or nonpolar? It's nonpolar, right? So it's a nonpolar stationary phase. So potentially, and we use water as a mobile phase. So potentially, if you have your sugars in there, would they like to interact with a nonpolar stationary phase? No. It's almost impossible to separate them just like that. Because then they won't interact. They will come with your void volume. They don't want to interact with hydrophobic columns. So, but you only have reverse phase available to you and you really want to use it. So, uh, it will work, but how we can do it work is very, very simple. You add salt to your mobile phase. And with doing that, you shift the interaction. Instead of liking the mobile phase, now there's a lot of salt on the, in the mobile phase, so the sugars will reluctantly stay on the column longer rather than go with the mobile phase. Another problem you have is the uh, presence of anomers, which in sugars you have anomers, which are stereoisomers, so this is an anomer to that. So presence of anomers might cause peak doubling or broadening. So what you do in order to avoid that and get good area under the curve, you use amine groups in the mobile phase you accelerate anomerization. So you accelerate it to move from one form to another and stay in one form so you get one peak. Okay. 
you can do ion exchange. So remind me again with ion exchange, what would be the stationary phase? What functional groups will be on the stationary phase in anion exchange? Oh, you couldn't have forgotten this already. Say something. No penalty for wrong answers. No shame for wrong answers. I'm sure you know deep inside of you. say anion exchange, what are we exchanging between the stationary phase and the mobile phase? Charges. Huh? Charge. Positive and negative charges. But we say anion exchange. The negative charge. The negative charge. So the solutes are negatively charged. So your stationary phase carries what type of functional groups to have interaction? Huh? Positively charged. I think you've forgotten all your chromatography. What? We spent days in lectures on an end. Should we go back to chromatography? Okay, review your chromatography. In the final, there will be chromatography. So please do review it. So yes, anion exchange, we are exchanging negatively charged groups, so your Stationary phase is positively charged. So how can we make a carbohydrate negatively charged? They are very weak acids. You can make the hydroxyl groups lose a proton if the environment is alkaline, too high pH. If the pH is high, then your carbohydrate hydroxyl group is going to reluctantly give you an H. Once it gives you a proton, then it becomes negatively charged then you can use anion exchange to separate them. So polystyrene divinyl benzene resin is a common one for carbohydrate um, use because they, can, they, are, they have large pores, so for large um, polymers or copolymers, they're good to separate larger uh, components, basically. Um, because they're charged, so common detector is the pulse amperometric detector or pulse electrochemical detector. So this is a common detector that is um, linked to this system. Please review detectors from the HPLC um, lecture. What would be the order of elution in this case? So what comes first? Let's say if I have glucose, if I have maltose, if I have another, like stachyos, what would be the order of elution? What comes out first, you think, from what you know that the separation is based off of? I'm going to call on random person. So all of you think about it. All right, Isabella, person in the corner, yes. tell me, what do you think the order of elution is going to be? Um, because we are basing on OH becoming ionized. So the more OHs you have, the more interaction of the column or less interaction of the column? You have more, right? Yes, because you have more of OH losing the H and more negative charge. So you're on the right track. So if they're interacting more with the column, a group, a uh, saccharide that has more OH will elute first or last? It will elute last. Okay, so if you have glucose, maltose, and stachyose, what would be the order? The one with the lowest OH group is what? First. So which one has the lowest OH number? A mono, a di, or a tetra? Yes. Okay, so glucose, maltose, stachyose. So the order of pollution from the smaller 
to the um, larger. Okay. This is just an example. All right. Um, cation exchange. So you can also have the positively charged groups. Okay, how am I going to make a carbohydrate positively charged? This is, you can do it. You can do it. You won't be able to make a carbohydrate positively charged. So what you use, you use counter ions. So you either you use a metallic form of an ion, calcium or silver, or um, or you can use acid where the H is the are the protons that can form complexes with the OH groups of the saccharides. So when they complex with the saccharide, then they are carrying now a positive charge. This kind of Chromatography actually oftentimes is a combination of ion exchange and size exclusion. So you do have separation based on size as well. So in size exclusion chromatography, what comes out first, the larger or the smaller? Larger. The larger. So if we look here, then sucrose comes out first, then the monomers. And because fructose is a ketose versus an hexose, the those comes out last. Okay. So last chromatography is gas chromatography. You can make sugars volatile. How can we make sugar volatile? By derivatization. Okay. Like you derivatize fatty acid, you can derivatize carbohydrates. Once they are volatile and thermally stable, then you can analyze them by GC. So you can do that for mono and disaccharides. You can do either silination, uh, silation, or acetylation. Acetylation is for monosaccharides. Silylation is for disaccharides. So but first. What you need to do is convert the monomers or the, your disaccharides to alcohol. And when they are converted to alcohol, then you do the acetylation. And then uh, they become esters, ac acetylated. And these become volatile and thermally stable. So, so you have here erythritol, inositol, these are internal standards that you can use. Again, you use a particular column, um, fused silica in this case, and then FID is a detector, and then you can separate the different uh, components based on their volatility, and yeah, based on their difference in volatility. Okay, so that summarizes chromatography of monosaccharides, disaccharides, and oligosaccharides. Next are polysaccharides analysis, and that's a good stop for next time.